Welcome to Plus TV. Today we have Eric Rosenfeld, activist investor and founder of Crescendo Partners, a New York-based firm that focuses on that area of activist and value investing. Eric, can you introduce us to how you got started 15 years ago? I had run the arbitrage department at Oppenheimer for about 14 years. CIBC bought Oppenheimer in 1997, and I had to stay for a year as part of that deal. And when the year was up, I left and founded Crescendo. And what we did and what we do is focus on the most profitable and the most interesting parts of what we had done at Oppenheimer, specifically activist investing and, and deep value investing. Eric, there are different approaches and strategies to activist investing. What characterizes yours and differentiates it? What we do as activists is we look for companies where there's a value gap, where, the, where there's a difference between where the stock is trading and where we think the stock could trade, and we work to bring out the value. And we do that typically by going on the boards of those companies. We've attempted to get on 22 different boards, and we've successfully, successfully got on 20 of those boards. The two other companies whose boards we didn't get on were both sold within two years of our attempt to get on the board because just our attempt highlighted the value of those companies. What are some of the other activist strategies and approaches that, that people take apart from yours? There are some activists that write nasty letters that try and embarrass companies and push them just into quickly selling themselves. And, and that's not a strategy that, that we follow. When we do have a proxy fight, we just stick to the issues. We don't try and embarrass the companies. And most of the time, though, we don't have to have proxy fights. What we'll typically do is we will negotiate with the company. And in a very short period of time, we'll typically reach an agreement to get substantial representation on, on the board. One of the last companies on whose board we got representation, it only took us nine days from first approaching the company to putting out a press release and having a signed agreement to get about 30% of, of the board. So Eric, tell me about your idea generation process and how you generate good ideas for undervalued companies where you can capitalize. Well, we get ideas from many different sources. Probably the most important is running our own screens, proprietary screens, and, and the most important metric that we look at is enterprise value to free cash flow. We want to see just what type of cash these companies can, can throw off. And there are other metrics at which we look, enterprise value to EBITDA, to operating income, EPS multiples. On the downside, we'll look at the liquidation value. And so those are some of the screens that, that we'll run. In addition to that, we've been on boards now with probably 200 other directors. And many of those directors serve on other boards. And they may call us and say, we saw how you were successfully brought out value when we were on the board together. And I'm on another company's board. And I think they could use your help also. Then we get ideas from analysts. You know, an analyst may or may not be good at finding an undervalued stock. But they will typically know if the shareholders are unhappy. And that's a requirement for us, is to have disgruntled shareholders or shareholders that want to change that will support us going on the board. So analysts will often let us know about that. Then another category from which we get ideas is from other shareholders, typically value investors. And you might have a value investor that enters that wait, hope, and pray mode. And, and they buy a stock. And of course, it should start going up just because they bought it. And many times, it doesn't happen. And after frustration sets in, we'll get a call from some value investors saying, I'm in this company. This is a story. Do you think that you could help act as the catalyst to, to bring out the value? And the last major category from where we get ideas is from employees of companies. And sometimes those are former employees that are hoping to get their jobs back if we come in. But we also get calls from current employees. And for, from the point of view of a current employee, if the company isn't doing well and isn't prospering, it may limit the advancement opportunities for that employee. And they feel that if maybe if the CEO could be changed or if the strategy could be changed, that there'll be more opportunities for them. And so they may call us and ask us to come in. So we get ideas from a myriad of, of different sources. And what's your process like once you identify those companies? What's your implementation strategy like? And also your exit strategy? Well, once we identified potential ideas, we do a lot of research on the companies. And sometimes we don't even want management to know that we're looking at the company. So we may not talk to management. 
but we may do something like for a software company, send someone to a user's conference and, and mingle with 300 customers of the company for several days and speak to them about why they chose that product over a different company's product and what's the price elasticity of demand and how sticky is the product and how responsive is the company to their needs. And you can learn an awful lot about a company that way. We'll read all of the filings that the company has made, including all the exhibits and the contracts that are attached. We will really delve into the company and speak to competitors and speak to suppliers. And we, d we do all our own research. We, d we do not use expert networks. And then once we've made that determination that we think that the, the company is a good investment, then we'll take a position in the company. Typically, it'll be 5 to 20 percent. And, and then we'll meet with large shareholders to see and gauge what type of support we have among the shareholders. Then typically, I will ask for a meeting with the chairman or chairwoman of the company and ask for board representation. And, and hopefully, and we're able to negotiate a, a quick agreement with the company. And it saves the time and expense and distraction of having to go through a proxy fight and so we like to have it happen that way, and usually, usually it does. And as far as an exit strategy, can you give us some insight as to how you extricate yourself from that board or that company? Well, the, the exit typically is, is not very quick. Our average holding period has been about three years. And in, in some cases, we'll, we may sell stock into the open market. In other cases, the company is sold, sometimes to a private equity firm, sometimes to a strategic buyer. But before that, we're putting a lot of work in at the board level looking to, to bring out the value. Do you see recurring issues in the companies, the kind of companies that you target? Absolutely, we do. We find that most companies in which we invest have one, of, one or more of five different issues that are causing that value to be, to be held down. And the first of those is management, where you don't have good management. In, in many cases, that's the, the CEO, where if there's a management issue, but it could also be the CFO, sometimes the general counsel. And there, there are probably three different reasons why you have bad CEO, if, if you have a bad CEO. The first of those is if you have an evil CEO. And by that, what I mean is a CEO that just views the company as his or her piggy bank. It's really there for the enrichment of the CEO. And the shareholders and maybe the other directors are an impediment that the CEO has to deal with in creating value for himself or, or herself. And so if, if that's the issue, then the CEO may, will probably need to be replaced. Another reason why you could have a bad CEO and need a management change is if you have a founder of a company and that person could be a great entrepreneur could be great at running a 25 million or a 50 million dollar company but if the company's 300 or 500 million or a billion it may be beyond the skill set of that person and and sometimes you need a catalyst to help convince that person that the range should be passed on to professional management the third reason why you can have an issue with management is the peter principle where someone gets promoted throughout a company, and then finally when they're made CEO, they reach the level of incompetence. So that's the, the first category of management being an issue. The, the second category is strategic or operational issues, where things need to be fixed at the company, either because the, the strategy is wrong or because the operations just need to be, to be fixed. And so you know, we may have the board put more of a focus on that. And, and part of that is making sure that the right management team is in place to fix those strategic and operational issues. What we don't do at companies in which we get involved is manage them. We don't micromanage them. And I'm the lead director of, of a uh, beverage company, and my previous experience with beverage was, was drinking soda. And what we do do is make sure that the right people are in place and that the right strategy is being followed and that the right capital structure is there. So that brings us to the, to the third category that we find may hold down value. And that's where you have a bad division masking a good division or divisions. The fourth category is a company that just needs to either buy other companies or be sold. You have a consolidating industry. And 
So we'll help with that determination, and then if the company needs to be sold, we have a lot of experience in doing that, and we can help in, in that process. And the fifth category is if the capital structure is wrong. And we greatly prefer companies that have too much cash as opposed to companies that have too much debt. And we'll look for those companies, should they be buying back stock, should they be paying dividends, a combination of the two, and take all of that into account. It seems very idiosyncratic to me when to look at a management structure or a manager and say, this person is not the right fit. And it seems like it's a skill set issue to a degree as far as if they're, a good, if they're well suited to bring that company forward. How do you identify that? It seems more of an instinct as much as anything. It isn't always easy to identify if a CEO is doing a good job or not, particularly from the outside. I mean, in some, some companies, it's just blatantly obvious. But in others, you need to be on the inside, and you need to be on the inside for a while, speak to other people at the company, and, and really make a determination whether the CEO needs to be re replaced or not. There, there are many companies that, uh, where we've gone on the board, and the, and the CEO has been doing a great job. And, and we have no interest in, in changing the CEO. There are others where the CEO was an issue. Sometimes you have a major conflict between the CEO and the CFO, and one has to go, and the board may have to make the determination as to you know, which one is, is going to go. So it's a matter of getting to know the, the person and really learning whether this person is right for that company at that particular time. Talk about some of your more notable successes over the years. Well, our, our first investment at Crescendo was a company called Spar Aerospace. And Spar was a Canadian company headquartered in Toronto. And they had been famous for making the Canada arm, but they had sold off that division just before we, we got involved. And Spar had about $8 a share in cash, and the stock was trading at about $9 per share. And it had no debt, and it had a very profitable remaining division. And that, and that division was maintenance, repair, and overhaul of airplanes and helicopters. And it was a very good business. And what was holding down the value of the company is that there was a lawsuit overhanging the company from a supposedly defective satellite part that they had made four years before from a division they no longer owned. The market cap of the whole company was $120 million. The lawsuit was for $140 million. So analysts just didn't know how to analyze this. So we hired attorneys, and they, we put a lot of resources into analyzing this lawsuit, and, and they told us that they thought it could probably set, be settled for about $15 million in the near term, or it could be fought for five years, and then you'd probably win. We sent in a requisition letter to the company. You need 5%. We own 20, and we aligned with another 38% of the shareholders. So when we sent in that letter, it was signed by 58% of the shareholders. And we replaced virtually the entire board. And about six weeks later, we had a mediation in Washington, D.C., and we spent three days with the others, with the plaintiffs and, and their lawyers and their insurance companies. And, and at the end of the three days, I went out into the hallway with their lead negotiator, and I said, we'll pay you $15 million. We'll never pay you a dime more than that, and you'll never see that number again. We have to leave in 20 minutes for our flight, so tell us what you want to do. And we went back into the room. Ten minutes later, the mediator came in, and he said they accepted your proposal. So we paid the $15 million. With that, that freed us up to do whatever we wanted with, with the company. and. We looked at whether it made sense to sell the company, and, and, and it didn't. The, the value at that point wouldn't have been high enough. So we decided to hunker down and, and bring out the value. And we promoted the president to CEO. The CEO became vice chairman. We combined plants in Mississauga outside of Toronto with a plant in Quebec and a plant in Ohio. We returned $4.00 about $4.35 of the cash to shareholders as a non-taxable return of capital, so about half the cash. We initiated stock buybacks. We put in a quarterly dividend that was a 9% yield, which really means that the stock had to go up at that point. And we increased the cash flow by about 80% over, over a two-year period, and then the company ended up being sold to L3 Communications, the big U.S. defense company, a few years later. You're very involved in the Canadian markets. Can you talk about the differentiation or the um, disparity between acting in both environments in the U.S. and Canada? The, is, it, is it easier to uh, implement an activist fight in Canada versus the U.S.? Canada is a very good place for activists. 
there aren't that many homegrown Canadian activists. Canadians are, are too nice to be, to be activists, I think. And I know uh, a lot of Canadians and have a lot of Canadian friends. And they're, they're all very nice. And the, in, in Canada, the, the rules are different. The laws are different. The, probably the most important difference is um, that if you own 5% of a company, you can requisition a shareholder meeting. And three or four months later, the whole board can be up for election. There are no staggered boards. And so that gives us tremendous negotiating power when we're going in and asking for, for board representation. And another difference is you don't have to surface in Canada until you have a 10% position, whereas in the United States, uh, you have to file a 13D at, at 5%. You also have more concentrated shareholdings in Canada. So we can get a quicker feel talking maybe to seven or eight institutions as to what type of support we have, where it might take going to a lot more institutions and, and shareholders in the United States to, to get that same feel. And another important difference is, is the poison pill. When poison pills were first instituted in the mid-1980s in the United States, and the Delaware court blessed it, the idea was it would prevent an unsolicited bidder from going over a certain threshold, typically 15 percent, but sometimes 10 or 20 percent, and it would uh, give the board some more time to look for alternatives. And in the U.S., that's morphed into a just say no defense. You could have 95% of the shareholders wanting to accept an offer, but if the board says no, the unsolicited bidder has to have proxy fights over two years to get control of a staggered board and remove the poison pill. In Canada, it's better than it even ever was in the United States. The idea is that the pill is just there to give the board a short amount of time to look for other alternatives. And typically, after two months, maybe three months, the regulators or the courts will issue a cease trade order and the poison pill will, will disappear if the shareholders want to accept an offer. The, the view there is that the shareholders own the company and should decide whether it should be sold or not, not the board. So a company that's put into play in Canada is probably more likely to transact than a company in the United States. What are the primary challenges you face in enacting a proxy fight? Well, most of the time we don't have to have proxy fights because We've built up this reputation of, you know, successfully getting on boards. Um, each successive board realizes they probably shouldn't fight us, and it makes sense just to, to make peace with us and, and bring us inside the tent. But sometimes we do have to have a proxy fight. Now, and a proxy fight is really a political campaign. And you're going out to the constituents who are the shareholders and trying to convince them that you can do a better job than the incumbent. And sometimes you're asking for control of the company, and other times you're asking for a minority of the board. And, and it's easier if you're just asking for a minority than, than asking for control. And, and to get a recommendation from ISS and from Glass-Lewis, that also is, is a lower bar to reach, just if to have a minority of the board rather than a majority of the board. So we have to have a story to tell those shareholders and explain to them why it makes sense to vote for us as opposed to the incumbents. And, and in many cases, part of that story is, you know, what's the downside? By if you, in particular, if you're going to give us a minority of the board, why not? Um, particularly if the incumbents haven't been doing a good job. You know, 25 years ago, institutions wouldn't readily support activists. Now that institutions have seen that activists really can bring out value, they're much more apt to, to support an activist if that activist has a good story and has, has a good track record. And so that's a very important difference for, from a long time ago to now. Can you give us some examples of, uh, of other elements of activist investing that have changed over the years since you started in, uh, I believe you started your firm in 1998? But even before then, throughout the last 20, 25 years? Well, you know, back in the 80s, there were raiders. And raiders sometimes green-mailed companies. And the, it, it, there was only uh, so many times that you could do that before it would tarnish your reputation and other shareholders wouldn't, wouldn't play along. You know, we, we have never green-mailed. We would never green-mail. Our view is that our reputation is so important. And, and we're really acting on behalf of all the shareholders when, when we're undergoing an activist campaign and, and going on the board and, and trying to, to bring out value. And, and many of those other shareholders get to, get to free ride, in effect, on, f for our efforts. And we're fine with that happening. And because what that means is that if people in the past have made money because of our efforts, they're more likely to support us the, the, the next time. So the, I, I'd say you know, the biggest change is that 
you don't have that that raider connotation back from the 80s where that where that catalyst back then was really just looking out for for himself and didn't care what happened to the other shareholders i think most activists do care and, and i'm sure that we do care that that we're creating value for, for everyone and so um activist actually now has i think a, a pretty good connotation in that shareholders that feel that they're stuck in a situation and don't want to take that action themselves may call upon an activist to see if they can help bring out the value where the shareholders feel that their value is there but there's some impediment to, to creating that value. So that openness to having an activist unlock the value compared to before where the view among institutions was vote with your feet. If you don't like it, sell the stock. And there were actually, and there still are management teams that say to the institutions, if you don't like what we're doing, then get out and sell your stock. But, but there really is a whole different path. And that's, excuse me, we own the company. We don't like what you're doing. We don't have to sell it. We can help change things. And the way you can do that is with an activist like us.